Case 16-4693, John Doe versus UC et al. For argu argument not to exceed 15 minutes per side, Mr. Priestley for the appellant. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Evan Priestley. I represent the appellants in this matter. I'd like to please reserve three minutes for rebuttal. All right. Your Honors, we're here today on the appeal of the district court's grant of a preliminary injunction in joining the University of Cincinnati from imposing its one-year suspension on plaintiff John Doe, a current graduate student at the university. We submit the district court erred in three ways, finding that Doe was likely to succeed on the merits, finding that Doe established by clear and convincing evidence that he would suffer irreparable harm, and finding that the injunction was in the public's interest. Regarding the likelihood of success on the merits, this issue comes to this court in somewhat of a unique posture, as both Doe and the district court focus primarily on one aspect of Doe's student disciplinary hearing, that being his inability to confront and cross-examine his accuser at that student disciplinary hearing. We submit that this, the district well, court... All, uh, the parties seem to keep using this, <clears throat> this term, cross-examine, and uh, my understanding as to what would occur had she attended actually would not be cross-examination uh, cross because uh, Mr. Doe and I and his, well, he, his counsel wouldn't have been permitted to say anything and he wouldn't have been a, permitted to ask questions. It would have, he would have had to submit the questions to the chair of the committee and then the committee could ask or not in their discretion. And, so it's not really cross-examination, cross but it's, it's, it's something less than cross-examination. Correct, Your Honor. I think that the, this court in Doe versus Cummins described it as somewhat of a circumscribed form of cross-examination, and it actually held in that case, which involved the same similar process, the, the two uh, individuals that were subject to disciplinary proceeding were able to examine the, their accusers through asking questions via the, the ARC panel, the disciplinary panel, and the court, this court in Doe versus Cummins said that that meant constitutional due process requirements. So we keep using the phrase cross-examination, but it is somewhat of a circumscribed form of cross-examination that would actually occur at the ARC hearing. Was Mr. Doe advised in advance that the complainant would not be attending the hearing? He aversed that he was not advised in advance. No, that what, I'm asking you. I do not know the answer to that. I, there, I, there's no evidence that you advised him that the complainant wasn't there? I, 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 I'm not aware of any communication that was, to, that was sent to him in advance saying that the complainant said that she right, was the, not going to attend. The rules say that if the complainant is unable to attend, that a notarized statement of the testimony may be submitted. Is there any evidence that the complainant was unable to attend? Not, not that I'm aware of, Your Honor. I'm not aware of... All right, the, the, then the admission of her statement violates your, your own rule, does it not? The admission since, of... Since your rules only provide if she's unable to attend, the statement may be used. The admission of the statement, both if, she was, if it wasn't that she was unable to attend, and we admit that she had, she's attached or submitted a non-notarized statement, which sure, was also... That violates your rules as well. It does violate, does violate the, the university's rules, but the issue here is whether or not he was afforded constitutional due process. Well, as this that, court, that's okay. So as you, this court acknowledged... You your rules were violated. In at least one aspect via the non-notarized statement, we can see that the rules were violated in that, in that instance. All right, and no evidence that she's unable to attend. She, whatever, for whatever reason, she doesn't show up. And Correct. this surprises him, so he does not have written questions in advance... Um, well, I don't know if he does or not, I guess. But there's nobody asked to ask the questions to. All right. Um, go ahead. Your Honor, we submit the district court aired as this court in Newsom versus Batavia Local School District held nearly 30 years ago that confronting and cross confront, confronting and cross-examination is not a due process requirement in that's, a student that, That's the general hearing. rule, though. And Correct. all those cases, <clears throat> including the case from our, our court, the Flam versus... Uh, College of Ohio, uh, they, they cite the general rule that there is no constitutional right to cross-examine your accuser in a disciplinary proceeding. However, a lot of these cases, including the Flum case, says a, a choice between believing an accuser and an accused, cross-examination is not only beneficial but essential to due process. 
So we have a lot of statements in the cases. I know this is not the holding of the case, but why isn't that really the accepted statement of law in our circuit and actually against around the country that although there's a general rule that there's no right always to cross-examine an accuser, there may be a, a case where the credibility of the accuser and the accused is such that the, the case will, will pivot on that and due process would require it. Why, why, why isn't that the law? Well, Your Honor, for, for two reasons. One, because the, the statements by these courts are dictum. In those cases, well, they it's acknowledge... Not it's not binding because it's not the holding, but tell me why that is not the law. It's not the law, especially in the Sixth Circuit, because the Newsom case actually dealt with issues of Newsom credibility. Newsom was a high school case. What about Cummings, which involved UC, and Flame, which Judge Griffin cites? Yes, those are both university cases. The Newsom case is a... And both said where credibility is at issue, some form of cross-examination was necessary, in essence. It stated that, but it didn't ultimately find that cross-examination was necessary in any form or fashion. So it didn't actually construct any rule that said, right, but in certain issues... Let's put this in the posture. The district court judge was making a preliminary injunction determination on the, pretty quickly, held a short hearing because UC didn't want to present any evidence, and then made a determination based on what he interpreted as governing law, and Cummings wasn't even out yet, that here, where credibility was at issue, I think he specifically said, where credibility is issue, some form of cross-examination is necessary. I agree with Judge Clay. It's cross-examination. It's not the proper term, but circumscribed, as you said. Correct. Um, at the preliminary injunction stage, yes, the judge is obviously making a determination on a very quick basis, but the likelihood of success on the merits issue is reviewed de novo by this court. So there is no deference that is needed to be made but to the district court's assessment on the likelihood of success on the merits. Sure, and likely we got to view it in the posture it was in at the district court stage, correct? Correct. And the preliminary injunction, we have to make sure he abused his discretion in looking at all the factors cumulatively and making a determination, correct? Correct, but the likelihood... And, and what we're saying is if there is some form of cross-examination that's necessary, especially when you violate all your other rules, no notarized statements, no, no notification that she would be unable to attend... He wasn't given any of that. Your Honor, I, I think the, the issue, and I'd like to get back to your point about the difference between the high school versus the college uh, setting. The, that, that gets to the, one of the Matthews versus Eldridge factors, the private interest that's at stake um, through the student disciplinary hearing. We're not arguing to this court that there is no protected interest that Doe has in his continued education. What we are arguing is that the private interest of a continued education for a college student is no greater than the private interest that a student has at an elementary or high school. Goss versus Lopez, which is the seminal Supreme Court case that said notice as an opportunity. No, but what, what they said and what Cummings says, I think, or maybe it's Blam, and I'm sorry if I don't remember which one. One of them says, look, UC has 44,000 kids. A high school has hundreds, maybe thousands, they know the individuals, whereas it's much less likely that they know the particular students involved. So that confrontation, albeit circumscribed, is much more important in that setting. That, that, was, the, that was Judge Barrett's discussion in this case, was the difference between this and the Newsom, or in, yes, in the Newsom Court's case. But that part of the discussion in Newsom was only a very small part. There was two issues of cross-examination in Newsom. It was cross-examining the unidentified student accusers and cross-examining the principal. And this, in the Sixth Circuit in Newsom... Newsom also involved marijuana, correct? It did. It Much involved, different than a he said, she said. Well, but in Newsom, the student accusers were saying that this individual possessed and was trying to sell marijuana, and he denied that that was the case. So there was certainly credibility at issue. Credibility versus a... I mean, it, it was a he said, he said versus a student accuser and the, the plaintiff in the Newsom case. So it was the same issues of credibility, albeit in a different context, but it was the same issues of credibility that were at play in Newsom and in this case. So this, this credibility exception that the court uh, in Flame has acknowledged in dictum and that the Win Second Circuit in Winnick has, Winnick has acknowledged in dictum and that Doe is trying to ask this court to adopt has already been dealt with by this court in Newsom. Additionally, Your Honors, if... Each case is, is factually different, isn't it? And yes, sir. Isn't, isn't, uh, you, you want us to have a bright line rule as to due process. The due process never requires 
the right of cross examination of an accuser and that's that's what you'd want but blue due process is more fluid than that is it is it not that due process changes depending upon the case the the nature of the case the facts of the case and the due process may require something in one one instance and not another instance i mean would you agree with me on that i would agree with you on that you're okay here is here they, a... they say this is really the exception to the rule here where it is just a he said she said and he he's accused of sexual violence that suspended from the university and uh He's saying, I can't get back, I'll, I'll, I'll have a hard time getting back into this university with a finding of responsibility for sexual violence against a fellow student. And I'd have a hard time getting into any other grad uh, school. I'm an adult. I'm not a kid. I'm not in junior high school or elementary school, but I'm an adult found responsibility for sexual violence. I mean, this is, this is serious stuff, is it not? It, it absolutely is serious stuff, and the university takes it very seriously too, Your Honor. And it it has you know it, it has an interest in maintaining its disciplinary system at the university level, and that interest should be enforced. And we believe that the district court erred in in joining the university from continuing with its disciplinary process. I think the 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 issue of the erred or abused its discretion. It abused its discretion ultimately in granting the preliminary injunction. Right. That's, the, our, that's our standard of review. Uh, the ultimate the ultimate decision the ultimate decision is abuse of discretion but the underlying success on the merits is reviewed de novo but we still we submit that the district court did abuse its discretion we just submit the district court improperly applied the governing law and used an erog erroneous legal standard both on the likelihood of success on the merits the irreparable harm and finding that it was in the public's interest now your honor you, you identified that the, the these factors need to be assessed all within one another and it comes within the comes each case comes on its own, that, that, but it involves the three Matthews versus Eldridge factors. And where the Newsom Court came out and held was that the burden of cross-examination on the administration of school discipline outweighs the benefits to be derived from that procedure. It went through and already has assessed all three of those Matthews versus Eldridge factors and held that the burden of cross-examination is going to be too great I, on school I administration. Newsom, it was equivocal ultimately and said there were circumstances where cross-examination would be necessary. The Newsom Court did not say that there was there were situations where the cross examination would be necessary. There was a clear holding in, New, in Newsom that said the burden of cross examination on the administration of school discipline outweighs the benefits to be derived from that procedure. Your Honor, I see that my time is up. I'll address additional points on rebuttal. Thank you. All right. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. The basic idea in this case is that my client, the plaintiff, may have deserved to be expelled or sanctioned by the school. But, and this is why we're here, the Constitution requires that if his behavior in some way is to be sanctioned by the school, then the state and the government and the school has an obligation to ensure the soundness of the decision um, that it reaches in this situation. And I really emphasize that word soundness. Because what's at heart at this case is this idea of, of confrontation or cross-examination. And I'll pause here as, as, as a footnote to, to address the question the court raised earlier, which is we call it cross-examination. And of course, it's not really cross-examination. It, it's, it's some kind of system where you could submit written questions that will be reviewed by someone with no legal training. Um, in, in some cases, we don't. Are you arguing that process is insufficient? I am not, but, but I, I, I want to not suggest that it is sufficient either. I, I, I really would suggest, if you ask me my personal opinion, I would say no, but that's not the issue before this court, because there was no confrontation. But if the claimant is there, there's a great opportunity to obtain information and assess the credibility of the alleged victim. Yeah, yes, Your Honor, and that's why I focused on that word soundness a, a minute ago, because cross-examination or confrontation is available not because we believe it, it makes the um, accused student feel better or feel like they had an opportunity to be heard or, or, or to soothe their, their conscience or something like that. But it's available because we believe it will lead to a more accurate outcome. And so if you think about what's going on in this case, we are saying that if you have the opportunity to ask the accuser questions, you will get more reliable information. 
And think about how this process works at the University of Cincinnati, where you have a person who believes that they are the victim of, of a sexual assault, and they, they go to the police, and the police don't do anything with it. So they go to follow up with the school. The school has a single investigator conduct a series of interviews with the person. In this case, they conducted four interviews with the complainant. But they're not really interviews because this is a person who's not a law enforcement officer or, or who's going back and forth and, and gathering information. But it's really just writing down, this is what the accusation is. And then that accusation is brought forward to the hearing panel that ultimately decides the case. Now, underlying all this, of course, is the fact that the school is deciding this case under the lowest possible standard of proof possible, preponderance of the evidence. So you have, on top of the fact that you have a system that is unreliable because you don't have any ability to confront the accuser, you're making that unreliable decision under the lowest standard of proof. Maybe this case would be different if they applied a reasonable doubt standard or, or a substantial evidence standard or something like that, but that's not what they do. It's There's some indication in the record that perhaps the school was, in the way it conducted the procedure, was attempting to satisfy the requirements of Title IX instead of uh, perform a truth-seeking function to ascertain uh, what occurred in, in the incident and what the culpability of your client might have been. Uh, could you comment on that? Yes, Your Honor. Well, I think underlying all of these cases, whether it's the Cummins case or whether it's this case or whether it's a number of cases that have risen around the country in the past couple of years, is the fact that the schools are doing things because the Department of Education is, is, is putting pressure on them um, through a, a, a dear colleague letter. Now, it's not even regulations from the Department of Education. It, it's merely telling them, you do this, or we're going to open up an investigation against you under the threat that we could revoke all of your federal funding. What's interesting about the timing in this case, of course, is that the complainant actually brings the allegation to the attention of the University of Cincinnati in September of 2015. University of Cincinnati doesn't really do anything with it other than talk to her for a little bit until about a week or a week and a half after they get a letter from the Department of Education saying, we're conducting an investigation into how you handle all of these cases. And if we're not happy with how you do it, we could revoke all of your federal funding. Now, the university has an obligation to um, comply with constitutional pressures or constitutional obligations, regardless of what the Department of Education in a dear colleague letter says to them. So, so I think to address your honors question, it doesn't matter what the Department of Education says to them for purposes of this case. The school still has to provide that constitutional due process and that opportunity that, to- That's right, but we're not talking about a criminal trial, and the courts have been pretty clear that outside of the criminal context, what is necessary for due process is much different than in a criminal trial. Here you have a victim that's been traumatized. The university has an obligation to protect her. And what they're trying to do is, that what they don't want is to subject that victim twice to essentially victimhood and make her go through that process. So why don't they have an obligation here to figure out a procedure which protects your client's rights, but at the same time protects her rights? I think they've done that, Your Honor, and, and I think if they actually followed their own rules, they, they would have done that. They, they had a system in place where um, if, when there is confrontation and when you respect the right of an accused student for confrontation, that confrontation is not direct. It is through written questions submitted through the chair of the hearing panel. They even have in other circumstances situations where people may not be in the same room. So there are all sorts of steps that the school has taken to protect against that re-traumatization so, that... Just so I'm clear, are you arguing that the due process violation is the failure to allow your client to cross-examine or the failure of the university to follow its own rules? It's the failure of the uh, university to provide an opportunity to cross-examine or confront the accuser. That's the due process violation. Um, whether the university complied with its own rules or not, uh, the district court suggested that could be an independent violation of the due process clause, but that's not really what, what was raised here because we don't need to get there. Um, I, I think the, the, the due process violation from lack of confrontation is there and subsumes all these other problems. Um, you know, had the university followed its own rules, it might be a different case. Had we had a notarized statement with some reliability to it, then maybe this would be a different situation. But we don't even get there, I, I think, respectfully, Your Honor. I, I think we just 
have to deal with the, the confrontation issue. Um, and, and I will, in all candor to the court, while, while the district court did suggest and cited um, a case from Pennsylvania saying that a university's failure to follow its own procedures constitutes an independent due process violation, the law on that is scattered all over the country. And, and, and there, is, there is good law suggesting that simply the failure of the school to follow its own rules is not a due process violation. And so they give them what's constitutionally required, right? It could be something else, but if they give your client what's constitutionally required, it can't under the due process clause, the fact that the university may give more, would that subject them to a due process allegation? No, I don't think it, it, I don't think it would. I, I think that it's an independent question. And, and, and if you had rules that, of course, that were inconsistent with the Constitution, they would have an obligation to follow the Constitution. Um, I, I think if you had a situation where the University of Cincinnati you wanted to claim was not following its own rules, you, you might have to even bring that case into court of claims in Ohio because you, essentially you're saying that this student handbook between the university and the student is a contract and the state of Ohio hasn't followed that contract and therefore the court of claims has exclu exclusive jurisdiction to, to, to deal with that. I, I know I'm getting far afield of, of, the, of the question, but I'm trying to, or, or the, the topic, but I'm trying to answer your honor's question as best I can. Mr. Engel, how much more time does your client have in this graduate program? He was um, at a, a year and a half um, when he was suspended. So he had... He's not suspended now. No, he's in the program. Oh, yes. So he would be, he's finishing this year. He's got one more year to finish up, your honor. Okay, so after this year, he'll be done. Okay. Yeah, it, it's it's unusual because it's 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 graduate school, and so he's got a thesis to finish, and, and he's got other things. So it's not like law school. If, if the suspension is upheld, what what does it say? I mean, that the University of Cincinnati has suspended Mr. Doe for what? What does it say? He was suspended for uh, one year. And given the opportunity to reapply to, to what, what, what is the what is the it's not the crime but what is the violation so that it will be on his record he's suspended. Well, you know, this is a very actually very difficult question to to, to answer, Your Honor, because he his permanent record, in, in other words, the documents specifically dealing with this case will indicate that he was. Um, suspended for a violation of the, uh, the the sexual misconduct policy. It would say that. It would say that. But the question is where it says that. And, and I don't want to. I don't want to mislead the court in any way. That there there is some dispute, and I can't tell you exactly what would be like on his transcript or his permanent record or anything like that. Well, but somewhat important, I think. It, it, it actually turns out to be, I'd suggest, Your Honor, less important than than you might think. The reason is because if he were to apply to another graduate program. Um, or if he were to apply for a professional license um, or, or something of the sort, he would inevitably be asked, were you ever subject to discipline at your prior school? And then, if yes, please explain why. And he would have to explain not only that he was subject to discipline, and, but the nature of the allegation against him, which, which of course, would, would be extremely damaging to his career. So, but, you know. But he would have a finding of responsibility. That's yes. a lot different than I was that somebody alleged something at one point in time. A lot of people have allegations uh, leveled against them, but a fine of responsibility is, is much, much different. Yes, so for the rest of his life, for example, if he, he would, would ask. He would have on his academic transcript a finding of responsibility of sexual misconduct against another student. I, I'm, I'm not sure, Your Honor, and this is why I'm trying to parse this very carefully. I'm not sure it actually is going to appear on his actual transcript. Different schools have different um, standards, and, 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 and as I stand here today, I'm, I'm not sure, and it's not part of the record, what the University of Cincinnati does. But the point is, from a practical standpoint, it, it would follow him if he tried to apply to any other graduate school or any other professional license or anything like that. I, I, I hope I'm, I'm not trying to dodge that question. It's, it's a very difficult question, and different schools well, have different standards. Yeah. Um, so with, with that, Your Honors, uh, I see my time is running short. If the court doesn't have any other questions, I'll just leave it to our briefs. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Any rebuttal? <clears throat> Your Honors, I'd like to address a few points and to answer Judge Griffin's question. I, I, I'm not exactly sure as to what appears on the physical transcript. Why, but why, the, why not? I mean, yeah, why not? I mean, you, you suspended him, and it, if, if it were not for the district judge issuing the preliminary injunction, 
it would would be on his record or maybe it was and it was taken off within a few weeks but your honor i'm sorry i don't know the answer of what it actually appears on his transcript but there's a few issues i'd like to rest on that point first educational records including transcripts are protected by the family educational rights privacy act there is privacy protections to the you say there's no that he he suspended he could get into another graduate program uh, I would think any graduate program would want a transcript of his of his record at uh, University of Cincinnati, and it's it's provided to the other school he's trying to get into. And I want to see, see what what would it say. And uh, it, it's pretty hard for me to imagine that it's going to help him at all if it's on his record mm -hmm. that he was found responsible for violent criminal misconduct. The the uh, other issue I'd like to address on that point, Your Honor, is that. What I think we're talking about here is a liberty interest that someone has in their name or reputation. The Supreme Court identified the due process level that's required when we're talking about a person's name or reputation that's at issue. Going higher all the time here. When it's, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, I, I think the, the interest is getting higher all the time when it's a permanent part of your academic record, that's all. It, well, in the Supreme Court in Goss, also was discussing discipline that was issued to students so the same issues were involved in that case, and it said the liberty interest that's at stake, the minimal requirements of the due process clause must be satisfied. The minimal requirements of the due process clause are notice and an opportunity to be heard, which Mr. Doe admits that he received in this case. Uh, one other issue I'd like to, to, to discuss is the, the notarized statement, the failure of the university so wait, to abide by its policy. Stop there. So it, before, if the university is going to suspend someone, all you're saying they have to do is give notice that there's allegations against them, let them speak their mind, and then they can make that determination. Those are the min those are the minimum due process requirements. And the university's position is that's all it's required to do under the due process clause. That, that's not that, that, that's not its position. That's all it's required to do under the due process clause. But the three things that the Sixth Circuit has said are notice, an explanation of the evidence, and an opportunity to be heard in front of a disciplinary hearing panel. The university provided all three of those things to Mr. Doe. So for those three things, that's, that's the university's position on what has to be provided for due process, and Mr. Doe admits that he received all three of those things. The one thing that he is claiming that he didn't receive was, an, was the ability to confront and cross-examine his accuser. But, Your Honors, the, the probable value of cross-examination in these cases is likely going to be minimal. In fact, if hearsay evidence is still allowed to be... That. Wait, the courts have said exactly the opposite. They've said when their credibility is at issue, cross-examination is critical. Courts have said that in dictum statements, but they've never actually analyzed under the Matthews versus Eldridge factors how that would actually play out in reality. The only case that has actually analyzed the three Matthews versus Eldridge factors is Newsom versus Batavia Local School District, but even and it Newsom, held... I mean, you keep coming back to that, but Newsom was a high school setting, and they said how important cross-examination was, and then they said, and I've got it open, they said the, fa the value of cross-examining student witnesses in school disciplinary cases, however, is somewhat muted by the fact that the veracity of the student account of misconduct by another student is initially assessed by a school administrator, in this case the school principal, who has or has available to him a particularized knowledge of the student's trustworthiness. And this court has noted that is lacking in a university setting with 44,000 students. I see my time's up, but like, can I address that point, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I, Excuse my, excuse my, but this court, I don't, I don't believe has held that. That was the district court's holding in this case. But what that ignores... This court hasn't held what? I'm sorry. Th this court hasn't distinguished the Newsom case on that point. That, that point was made by the district court in its opinion. I, I don't believe that distinction is made by, has been made by this court. But what that ignores is there's a whole other section of the Newsom court's opinion that discusses cross-examination of the school principal in that case. And in that case, the Newsom court stated to saddle school administrators with the burden of overseeing the process of cross-examination and the innumerable objections that are raised to the form and content of cross-examination is to require of them that which, that which they are ill-equipped to perform. And then continuing, the court said, by diverting school administrators' attention from their primary responsibilities in overseeing the educational process to learning and applying the common law rules of evidence simply outweighs the marginal, marginal benefit that will accrue to the fact-finding process by allowing cross-examination. Okay, so there's two different aspects. You have a, you have a credibility contest here. A he, he said, she said. I mean, that, this is the classic example where cross-examination is the best tool to seek the truth as to who is telling the truth. I mean, but the, isn't this? I mean, if, if there ever is a case that 
cross-examination is important. The mo most, a lot of judges said it's the most important tool we have to seek to seek the truth is cross examination. But, but, but cross examination, as it arises as it arises in the criminal context or civil courts, also has all the other procedural protections that surround the ability to cross examine. I, and, I, I'm not going to give students all the all the protections of a criminal trial, but when someone's liberty interest is fundamentally at issue here, in such a way that uh, it seems like you need some protections. Your Honor, can, I, can I address that that point? Quickly. I mean, minimal. It, uh, other counsel talked about soundness of the procedure. The, the law says the procedure has to be fair. It has to be a fair hearing. It may not be a criminal hearing with all the, uh, all the safeguards, but it has to be fair. And their argument is that this just wasn't fair. To Mr. Doe. But, but without all those other procedural protections, the, the value of cross-examination decreases substantially. Because if hearsay evidence is still allowed in, which this court has said that it is, then the value of cross-examination decreases significantly. In fact, I mean, the principal reason for excluding hearsay is because it can't be challenged. The, the veracity or truthfulness in the statement can't be challenged on cross-examination. The, the, the second point on the, the potential value of the cross-examination ignores the fact that the university has no legal mechanism upon which it can force individuals to come to these student disciplinary proceedings. They don't have subpoena power to force these individuals to come to the hearing. So if someone just ignores... You have to decide whether the evidence is sufficient as a preponderance of the evidence. And I, I, I would think the, the fact that a complainant doesn't show up might diminish the value of the complainant's uh, statements that are not notarized. That's I, all. I, I think it goes to the balancing of preponderances. Absolutely, Your Honor, and I think it very likely did. And I think it, for this court to say otherwise would be to step into the shoes of the disciplinary hearing panel how that reviewed those statement, statements. How do you say the statement is credible when you've never even seen the witness? And it's all, because, it's all hearsay, secondhand, but we find the statement in the Title IX report to be credible. I, I, don't, I don't know how you could I, make such a finding. I, I think, again, Your Honor, I think that would be stepping into the shoes of the hearing panel and determining whether or not they could view something as credible, I, I even though they were the ones that were sat there. And you know your time. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, case is well argued and case is submitted. There being no further cases for argument, court may be adjourned.